Okay. <clears throat> Whether you are members of our forum or joining our conversation for the very first time, welcome to everyone to the very, very first public meeting of the EUI Democracy Forum. I'm Professor Calypso Nicolaides, co-conveners of with my friends uh, and colleagues, Alberto Alemano and Nicola Milanese of this forum. And I should just mention and thank the rest of the team here at STG, Jamie, Ulrike, Karsten, and Michaela. Um, well, you know, our forum has been existing for a year and a half, bringing together academics, practitioners, including from EU institutions and, and civil society groups to really discuss the, the, the promise of greater citizens' participation in the EU adventure. Uh, and who can question how important and urgent this agenda is when we can only see that spaces for civil engagement are actually shrinking around the world and even in Europe. Uh, uh, and we see as teacher at the same time, the participatory imagination um, of the new generation of our students, of everyone who wants to contribute to collective intelligence in Europe and beyond. So there's no doubt that there is a democratic urgency and a chance to make it happen today in the post-COVID era. And indeed, this is what, what is called the Conference on the Future of Europe, COVID, um, is supposed to be all about, is all about, led by the three core institutions of the EU. Um, it's the forum, the, the point of this conference to bring citizens and to find ways of bring, bringing citizens in closer to, um, to the core of EU politics. And this is why the early life of our forum has been dedicated to discussing this conference on the future of Europe. But when this all comes to an end, the specific conference, um, sometimes next spring, we're not quite sure when, we will all be asking, you know, what next? Okay, what does this whole process led to? What should it lead to? And, and of course, um, at the center of this process, uh, we've had citizens assemblies, citizens panels, four of them, trans-European, of course, many more at the local and national level, but transnationally four. And we're very, very lucky um, that the Conference on the Future of Europe has chosen Florence and EUI to hold uh, one of these four assemblies. Indeed, next weekend, as many of you know, those of you who are involved, and we will be the very first of the four to be happening. So we are in a way in Florence at EUI, an experiment within an experiment. Um, and we're very excited for this. But what we want to do and ask today is to, to to put our gaze on the long view, <clears throat> to ask together uh, whether what the citizens are doing as a citizens panel, as four citizens panel, transnational within 24 languages across many different boundaries, what they're doing should become a more permanent feature of the European Union, whether this makes sense, A, eh? and if so, how, there are many different ways of doing it, and when, and in, 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 in what kind of ways, what are the sequence? Um, so to, to ask this question today about a permanent transnational citizens assembly for the European Union, we have an inspiring array of speakers that will address the topic. And you might notice that we indeed have eight speakers. So that, that's many speakers, a tiny bit unbalanced gendered wide, but we did our best. And, um, and we are very well represented, in fact. Uh, uh, I say we, as women. Um, and so first, we will have two presenters uh, who will lay out somehow the landscape for us. Yves Saint-Omer from the University of Paris and, and Oxford University. Uh, and Claudia Schwalis, who is or currently leading the OECD work on participatory and deliberative democracy. But they both bring to the topic tremendous experience in designing, making it happen on the ground, as well as their conceptual reach. Uh, so even Claudia will first present for 15 minutes each, Eve more on the why question, indeed he's 
just finished a book um, on this question of sortition, Citizens Assembly, that will be a tremendous um, contribution to the field. So more on the why question and Claudia more on the how question uh, from her accumulated experience and overview of, of this experience. How do we make all of these experiences around the world of Citizens Assembly how, somehow translate, how do we translate them at the EU level? After even Claudia, we will have two groups of three speakers for five minutes each. Uh, David Farrell comes from, to us from Dublin, University College Dublin. And many of you know he was instrumental in the citizens' assemblies in Ireland. Um, and Gabriella Cretu is, is plugging in from Bucharest. She is a, a, a representative for the Social Democratic Party and has been very vocal in, on these issues. Um, Gabriella, welcome. And Karsten Berg is an, um, with us at EUI, EUI Bergeron Fellow, um, and has been um, sharing and promoting the um, Citizens um, Initiative, European Citizens Initiatives for many, many years now. Uh, and also, of course, very involved in the field. So they will, this first group will provide a first kind of more critical viewpoint, drawing on the current conference on the future of Europe to ask about this question of permanence. And then we'll have a second group, more kind of for a longer, the, the longer, more institutional view. Uh, Christoph Niesen is a postdoc's Max Weber fellow at EUI, himself drawing on his experience in Belgium and Germany to talk about the EU level. And then my uh, last but not least, my two uh, dear co-conveners of the EUI Democracy Forum, so Alberto Alemano uh, come from HEC Paris, but also with his second hat. You notice everyone has two hats somehow today. Um, it's the winter, we need lots of hats. And, and so <laughs> Alberto, professor at HEC, but also leader of the Good Lobby, uh, which has been doing its good work in Brussels for several years now. And Nicolo Milanese, who heads the European Alternative Think Tank, but also is the founder uh, and chair of um, this assembly, this network of citizens, um, uh, citizens of organization entitled now uh, provocatively Citizens Take Over Europe, CTOE having itself actually laid out a blueprint on citizen, a permanent citizens assembly for Europe. So you see, quite an array, quite a menu for us. And, um, and I'm very, very much looking forward to hear our speakers, but then this should take us for about an hour. And we have a second hour where we very much hope that all of you on the call will come in with your questions either in the chat or by raising hand. So be ready as soon as we have done the rounds to chip in and contribute to the conversation with all your comments and questions. So without further ado, I now turn to Eve first and then Claudia. Thank you very much, Calypso, for this introduction and the possibility to discuss with you today. Um, let me check. And I'll give you a sign after 14 minutes. Please. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. I'm a bit sick today, so I hope I will be understandable. Um, I think that we, we, should be, we should begin from where we stand now. And we have to realize that the model of democracy, uh, which was the model in Europe, and in North America after World War II is in a big crisis. It has been an historical parenthesis, very interesting, but to some extent, we are experimenting something different now. Electoral representation was at the core of the system. The big democratic theories were relying on this model, but there were a number of conditions the social market economy, the welfare state, mass political parties, the need to represent future generations and non-humans was not even discussed. It was an exclusive club and it could be this club because of the exclusion of the other in the world. 
Um, and, and knows that the world is quite different, uh, knows that society is quite different. The fact that the political system has not changed a lot is a big problem. And I think that we should look at this model a bit like we look at Athens, a very interesting and important historical experience, but a limited experience. And politics in this century will be much different from politics as it used to be in the last century. To some extent, the golden age is over. For the EU, what does this mean? I'm not a specialist of the EU, and many among you are uh, much better, have a much better knowledge of the EU. What I can say, I mean, from my point of view, is that the EU politics is even more distant from citizens uh, than national governments. Um, the EU is a quite exciting and beautiful project, but it has been made largely without the people. Uh, we are not sure whether there is a European people or several European people, and therefore what Calypso uh, calls a democracy rather than a democracy. Uh, EU is a, an easy target for instrumental political gains at national level. It's the fault of the EU. The EU is responsible for all which doesn't work well. In the last couple of years, the EU has not demonstrated uh, to be very efficient. The Brexit was very difficult. The management of the COVID crisis was not very convincing. There is authoritarian tendencies which are growing. It's clear in some East European countries, but take a country like France, where I come from, the European, the authoritarian tendencies are really growing. It was not conceivable even a couple of years ago. The refugee crisis is also a big challenge. And I, I think that the EU is at the crossroad. My first thesis is that to face the new challenges of this century, the status quo is a dangerous option. Citizen participation and democratic innovation between electoral representation and party politics are crucial if we want to give more legitimacy and dynamics to the EU project and to democratic politics within the EU. And in this perspective, I think it's crucial to add new democratic pillars, not just complements, marginal footnotes, but really new democratic pillars to give a new impetus to European democracy. And there are ways of reforming the institutions as they are between parliament, commission, and, and the council. But there are also other ways, um, direct democracy, participatory governance, and randomly selected citizens assembly and many publics. This is what we will discuss today. And this is true both at national, at local, and at EU level. My second thesis is that there has not been only one deliberative wave, but two uh, different ones. The first one, which began in the 80s of the last century, uh, was the idea was to construct an enlightened and consultative public opinion. This enlightened public opinion had to be representative. The many publics uh, relied on some representative samples or at least fair cross sections of the people. These were top-down instruments, tightly controlled by those who invented them. Most often, there were one-shoot events. There was a high-quality deliberation of ordinary citizens, but what the output was was only consultative. And there was a kind of democratic elitism in this perspective. The enlightened public opinion of the mini publics could be directed against a wider public sphere or at least protected from the social movements and the political and economic actors. 
And at EU level, there were several experiments uh, during the Plan D Europe and other mini publics was also organized at EU level, but nobody cared. It was for the show to some extent. The second wave is a bit different because it relies on empowered mini publics and they are in a process of institutionalization. They do rely, rely on the first wave, sociological representation, high quality deliberation, epistemic democracy, the wisdom of the many, but uh, they are at least to some extent empowered. They are not only consultative, they begin to be institutionalized, and this is what we will discuss also today. There is a multiplication of experiments and hybrids. The Conference on the Future of Europe is something completely new, which had not been planned by any scholar. They have a link to representative democracy, but also to participatory, direct, and grassroots democracy. And the actors are more diverse. They are top down initiatives, but also bottom-up movements, which claim for citizen assemblies. There are rulers and social movements, which is quite different from the first wave. To some extent, the uh, Conference on the Future of Europe is part of this second wave, but with strong limitation, and other speakers will come back on this. The fact, for example, that in France, the so-called yellow jackets ask, at least part of them, ask for a citizen assembly is completely new. And in England, the fact that uh, Extension Rebellion claim uh, as its fourth pillar, citizen assemblies for the climate is something new. My third thesis is that we do need a permanent European citizens assembly. The, co the conference on the future for Europe is a pilot experiment. If we take it as a pilot experiment, it could be a success as such with strong limits, but perhaps making European elites aware that this is a potential instrument for um, democracy. It's not sure yet that it will succeed, but at least we can see it as a step forward. Institutionalization would be a guarantee of independence beyond the tight control of the secretariat, which characterizes the conference, which takes place at this and the time being. The intervention of the organized civil society is needed to really secure something which would make sense. What would be the rationale of a permanent citizen assembly? Representing the diversity of European citizens statistically and symbolically, because such a conference, such an assembly would be much more diverse than the European Parliament or the European Commission, sociologically speaking, it will it would bring a lot of experiences from the society, from all spheres of society and all countries. Uh, it will also be symbolically another representation of the people in Europe, the European people, or the plural of democracy. It, will, it would increase the deliberative quality of politics in Europe and epistemic democracy very often debates in the European Parliament are so politicized and so partisan that it, they are not a, a, a real deliberation. At this level, and others, other speakers will probably come back on this, there are strong limits on the deliberative quality of the Conference on the Future of Europe. It would be beyond professional politics, less influenced by powerful lobbies, and the lessons of previous citizens assembly are very positive at this level. They are able to propose reasonable perspectives, but also ambitious perspectives, at least more ambitious than governments or parliaments had done previously. But it should go also beyond technocratic democracy 
alternatives have to be discussed. Citizens have to uh, be able to see among what societal and political choices they have to choose. They could try to make a synthesis, but at least there are controversies that go much beyond any technocratic politic. And some empowerment is needed to give to such a potential assembly a real power within European politics. But for what kind of politics and what kind of democracy? My fourth thesis is that there has been two models of citizens mini publics, the court or jury model on the one hand and the assembly model on the other hand. In the first model, citizens have to make hearings of the opposite views and experts. Impartiality is crucial. The management has to be neutral. Uh, no of few contacts with external actors and the media. Politicization is something bad. Formally and procedurally, it seems quite legitimate, but is it powerful? The assembly model, in this model, the procedural fairness is important, but it is only part of the story. The citizens assembly becomes a political actor, needs to make alliances to change politics and society. Very often there is a link with direct democratic procedures. Impartiality is less central. For example, uh, uh, relations could, be, could develop between the citizens which are part of the assembly and social movement. It seems more politically powerful because it can make alliances, but it is also much more controversial. To some extent, the Irish Constitutional Convention and the French Citizens Convention for the Climate are opposed models. I mean, it's too caricatural to say this, but to give these examples, these real examples. The issues were quite different, yes or no, for the most visible uh, choices the Irish Constitutional Conventions, Conventions had to propose, a quite open agenda for the French Convention Citoyenne pour le Climat. Different procedures. The French was a mess compared to the Irish one. When the main proposals of the Irish one were compatible with the government, governmental agenda, this was not the case in the French experience. And the link with the organized civil society was much more important in the French case. What lessons can be drawn for a European Permanent Citizen Assembly? And unfortunately, in, in one minute. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm, I'm concluding. Thank you. Probably a mix. Uh, European politics must be less adversarial than most national politics. The voice of the organized civil society, but also alliances, uh, yes, has to be heard within the convention, within the assembly, but some alliances have to, be, have to be made. So it will probably be, be a mix for a potential European Permanent Citizen Assembly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yves. That was really an excellent introduction to the whole topic, coming from afar with the two waves um, to not just the Athens reference and indeed opening up various models. Uh, and I'm sure now that Claudia will be able to kind of build on Eve's opening to tell us a bit more about the how. Thanks very much, Calypso, and, and thanks Eve for that great introduction and overview. I'm really glad that I've been asked to just concentrate on the, on the how question. Are you able to see my screen now? Yes? Yes. Okay, good. I can't see everyone when I have the slides open. So um, very good. So, so my name is Claudia Khalish. I'm, I'm working at the OECD on work around innovative citizen participation. Um, it's really 
a great pleasure and be to be here and really an honor to be amongst all of the really distinguished speakers that are also invited to, to comment on this. Um, what I'm going to share today are a few new reflections which build on the work that we've been doing at the OECD around deliberative democracy more broadly now for the past year and a half. Um, so, so last year we published a report called Innovative Citizen Participation and New Democratic Institutions Catching the Deliberative Wave, which gave a sort of broad overview about what's been happening uh, over the past few decades in this field. Mm -hmm. Off of the basis of, of that evidence, we developed good practice principles for deliberative processes. Uh, just last month, we published evaluation guidelines, and next week we're publishing a new paper that I've written about eight ways to institutionalize deliberative democracy. So I'm going to be talking about this new paper, and it's the first time I share some of these ideas here. Um, so I'm going to talk mostly about what's in the paper, but connected at the end to some of the lessons and questions I think we can take away from that for the EU level. Um, so just to, to, to give the bigger picture, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, you know, where, where some of my reflections and thinking are coming from or from the understanding of the bigger wave um, around deliberative democracy. So I really like the way you've made this distinction of the, of the two waves, actually. Um, we've seen this a bit in the OECD data as well. So just last week we, or two weeks ago, we published an update to our database, which now has 574 examples, 566 of which are from from the OECD countries. And we can kind of see what Eve was talking about, that actually from the late 70s, 80s onwards, there were a number of, of uh, deliberative processes happening, but I, I, would, I would actually share that analysis that they were more of um, that less empowered sort of model. And since the 2010s, and I would say even more so in the past two, three years, we've been seeing much more of these empowered assemblies taking place. Um, these are the good practice principles that we developed, but I'm not going to, to go into detail about this now. Um, just to say that I, I think that for any consideration of a permanent citizens assembly or a permanent or institutionalized form of deliberative democracy, I still think we should be keeping in mind such principles, such as having clearly defined purpose, accountability, transparency, really doing random selection processes in a way that fulfill this principle of representativeness and where everybody has an equal chance of being selected uh, to be part of it, um, that there's enough time for the deliberation and, and so on. So in this paper, I look at eight different ways that we've seen deliberative democracy being institutionalized. Now, I should say this is not it's not really a theoretical paper. It's more descriptive, actually looking at what has been taking place. Uh, and it goes into examples of each of these eight models, um, one being combining a permanent citizens assembly with one off citizens panels. Um, so I'll give two examples of, of this from Paris and Ausbelgien, two being connecting deliberation to parliamentary committees, which we're seeing happening more and more. Three is combining deliberative and direct democracy. Four is having standing citizens advisory panels. Uh, so we have a few examples of this from Canada and I'll talk about one of them. Um, five is having sequenced deliberative processes throughout the policy cycle. So I'll share what um, is going on in the city of Bogota, Colombia. Um, sixth is, is requiring public deliberation before certain types of public decisions. Seventh is allowing people to demand a deliberative process. So in the same way that through a petition, often we can demand a referendum. Um, we're seeing in some places that petitions can lead to a deliberative process being initiated. Um, and finally, embedding deliberative processes in local strategic planning. Um, so this we've seen in one of the states in Australia. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here because it's probably the least relevant, but I'll talk about examples from, from the other ones. Um, so first to give an example from the city where I am right now in Paris. Uh, so about two months ago, the Paris City Council voted to establish, um, which means it's now in the city's regulation, a permanent Paris Citizens Assembly. Um, and what this entails is that there are 100 people living in Paris, not necessarily French citizens, anybody living here, 16 years and over, who have been selected for a one-year mandate. Um, and they'll be meeting face-to-face -face, uh, for at least once a month for the next year. Oh. Um, uh, sorry. Um, and... 
and they have a number of um, they have a number of of mandates that to, to take care of during this time. So one is that there's a connection to the Paris participatory budgeting, um, which means that the Citizens Assembly will actually choose the theme of this for the following year. Secondly, they will also be able to choose the issue, which will go to a one-off citizens jury. Um, that citizens jury will be able to draft uh, what's called a deliberation, which is just a local bill, which will go directly to the Paris City Council to be um, deliberated and voted on by the councillors. And then in addition to that, uh, the Citizens Assembly itself can also submit written questions to the Paris City Council. They are also able to choose the topic and elaborate their own deliberation or local bill. And then finally, they're also able to initiate an information and evaluation mission of an existing policy that the City of Paris has already enabled. And now in response to any of these things that the Citizens Assembly is able to do, uh, the, the new legislation in the city requires that there's a written response both at the time of submission and then one year later to say what has actually happened in response to this. Another example that we have of this model that connects a permanent citizens assembly with one off panels is from us Belgian, which is this, the German speaking community of Belgium. Um, it's the, the smallest region, but it has its own set of competencies so connected. So in February 2019, the regional parliament there voted unanimously to establish a new institution called the Citizens Council, um, which has 24 members, a third of which rotate every three, every six months, sorry. Um, and they meet every, every month for a year and a half. And they have two main roles. One is to choose the issues that will go to one-off citizens panels. So that can be up to three every year. And for each of those citizens panels, 25 to 50 people are chosen by a civic lottery and they have to have at least three meetings over the course of three months. Although this can be longer depending on the issue. And those citizens panels recommendations then go to the parliament, uh, which has to have at least two parliamentary debates about those recommendations. And then the second role of the Citizens Council is to monitor the response to those citizens juries recommendations. Another way that we've been seeing deliberation being institutionalized is from is in Brussels. Um, so they have established a model of deliberative committees, uh, which can be initiated either by the MPs who are in the parliaments, or it can be citizen initiated. So if there's at least a thousand signatures to put an issue on the table, it can be considered um, and ultimately approved by one of the parliaments to establish this mixed deliberative committee. Um, so there's a civic lottery to choose the 45 residents from Brussels who are part of it. But what's a bit different here is that they sit alongside 15 MPs. And these would be the MPs that would normally be in normally be part of the committee that would be established to deal with that issue anyways. Um, so anybody who is 16 years and over and is a resident of Brussels, not necessarily someone who, with a, a Belgian nationality is eligible to be part of this. Um, they have to have at least one information evening and a minimum of four days of face to face meetings, although we've already seen that depending on the topics, they have necessitated a bit more time. There is a process of the citizens and the MPs voting, which is a little bit different um, because of the rules kind of presiding over the general parliament where the MPs votes must be public, um, whereas the citizens votes are secret in line with the pro in line with how this usually happens in in many deliberative processes elsewhere. Um, but at the end of the day, there's also an additional deliberation to discuss any amendments and their vote before they actually agree collectively on the recommendations. So even though there's still this voting process which needs to take place, um, the the overall process takes place in such a way that those recommendations are really co-created by the citizens and the MPs. Um, so these then go to the Brussels Parliament. Um, the MPs that are involved in the committee are required to follow up on the recommendations within six months. Um, and then the deliberative committee is reconvened for one day at the six month period. Um, and the government and the parliament are obliged to respond to all of the recommendations. Um, so when we think about what Eve was saying about empowerment and actually having some, some influence, um, 
we see with institutionalization taking place that actually by anchoring this in regulations of how the parliament functions, it necessitates that these recommendations cannot just be ignored and there needs to be public justifications for why they're not being accepted or how they're going to be implemented. Um, another model, which some of you may be familiar with, is the Citizens Initiative Review, which or initiated in Oregon in the States, now takes place in, in, many other, in, my, in many other states in the US and has also been tried in Switzerland as well as in Finland in Europe. Um, so usually it takes place in such a way where this is, this is a connection to delib connecting deliberative and direct democracy. So in places where there are regular ballot measures, I think this is an interesting consideration for how that process can be improved by adding a deliberative element to it. Um, and even though we don't see this too much at the EU level, I think there could be some considerations for eventual considerations of things like preferendums, which is something that I know that Calypso has written about and David Van Raybrook has also proposed um, at different times. So the Citizens Initiative Review works in such a way where on the issue of, of a ballot measure, a broadly group of, of representative people, a small group of 24 people, have the time to, to learn and evaluate the different proposals um, and rather than coming up with any recommendations themselves, they, they develop a collective statement of facts, which then goes in the voters pamphlet that goes out to all of the voters ahead of their, ahead of their vote. Another model that we've seen, which I think could be interesting for the EU level is the Toronto Planning Review Panel. Um, so there's been two iterations of this and there's also another panel in the greater Toronto area around transport issues. And how this works is that um, there's a panel of, one of them has had 28 people, another has had 32 people who are members um, that are residents from the greater Toronto area and they have a two year mandate. Um, and over the course of those two years, they first have four days of learning and training to just understand how planning decisions work and what are the main things on the table. And then they have 11 full day meetings spread out over those two years where they're able to provide ongoing citizen input, which is informed on issues of planning and transportation to the Toronto City Planning Division. Another model, which is just being kind of experimented and tested out now, which is newer, is from Bogota in Colombia, and it's called the Itinerant Citizens Assembly. Um, itinerant referring to the fact that there's a, a series of citizens assemblies which pass on recommendations between themselves before a final set of recommendations goes towards the city council. So in the first example of this taking place in December of last year, there was a citizens assembly of 110 people who had the mandate to propose objectives for addressing the main challenges in Bogota. And so they were divided into six commissions of main policy areas. So things like, um, like transportation and environment and so on. Uh, they had two weeks of learning and then they had two full days of deliberation. And their collective proposals have now been passed on to a new citizens assembly, which will develop much more fleshed out policy recommendations linked to those general objectives that were identified. And that will then go to the Bogota City Council. Um, one other thing that we, sorry, I realize that's probably a lot of information, but I'm happy to also go back and answer questions about those. One of the other things that I, I talk about in the paper, besides going over those examples and also numerous other ones, is also the strategies and requirements that are needed for institutionalization to actually happen and be possible. Um, so things like considering the right institutional design. Uh, I hope one thing that has come out from these descriptions is that in each place, there's a whole set of institutional considerations that need to be taken into account, for instance, like in Paris, there's a really well-established participatory budgeting. How can we connect a new institution to that? Um, next is the need for political support across party lines. Also support is needed from civil servants who will be there to, to implement and to actually serve as the backbone to making these things happen. Um, drumming up support from the public and the media is also important. Um, having considerations around the legal and regulatory framework also matter. Um, like, I, like I was saying, anchoring this in, in regulation and in legislation really changes the, the, the rules of the game around all of this. Um, 
Next is having the capacity within and outside government to actually deliver. So one thing I haven't gone into the details of here is the fact that in these cases, there's also an independent secretariat, which is responsible for the implementation. So of doing the civic lottery of, um, you know, ensuring there's the facilitation and all sorts of other aspects that are needed to, to help establish this. So at the EU level, I think it's quite interesting that there was recently launched the EU Competence Centre for Participatory and Deliberative Democracy. Um, so the EU is actually already kind of beefing up that capacity to be able to deliver something like this. But ultimately, it also needs the funding to, to back it up and to make this a reality. When we think about how much we spend in our democracies towards elections, um, we also need to be thinking about how can we put serious funding towards other democratic institutions. Claudia, um, yep. you can slowly wrap up because your time is over. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so I, I just have three, I'm just going to go over my, my bullet points here about the considerations I have for the EU level from, from all of this work. Um, my first one is that, you know, is it really about a permanent EU citizens assembly or is it another form of institutionalization or rather an ecosystem of different models? So more towards open democracy and considering how these different models of institutionalization can actually be happening concurrently. Um, another thing to think about are the potential mandates which could be relevant at the EU level, whether that's agenda setting, developing policy recommendations, providing feedback on draft legislation, monitoring evaluation, reviewing and proposing adaptations to existing legislation. I think we need a lot more imagination to the potential capacities of a new institution that brings in citizens. Next is how could these new deliberative body or bodies interact with the EU's legal and institutional framework to have a meaningful role in decision making? I think maybe Alberto will come in with some, some concrete ideas on that. Um, is there a potential to connect it to existing mechanisms like the European Citizens Initiative? Could we envisage a standing advisory panel for certain policy areas, for example, on the climate crisis or perhaps one for each commission directorate? Um, how about citizens panels connected to parliament committees, but then should or could they be part of trilogues, which would therefore need to be renamed? Um, what about the establishment of requirements for public deliberation for certain EU policies? So for instance, to develop operational programs for cohesion policy funds, something that happens recurrently every seven years and has a lot of money at stake. Um, and finally, I think the Conference on the Future of Europe is really demonstrating that EU level public deliberation is possible. And now it's about learning the lessons from it and thinking creatively about the bigger picture and what that means. So my concluding thought, and I swear this is my last slide clip. So um, I think that institutionalizing deliberative democracy at EU level is possible and desirable. But I think we still need a lot more consideration when it comes to the purpose or purposes the forms it could take, and also the relationships with the existing EU institutions. But I'm really excited and grateful that you're creating the space to, to have this conversation at the EUI. So th thanks very much and sorry about the timing. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Claudia. And it's very clear to everyone in the call that you've provided a vast array of potential models but at the same time, falling back on your feet at the end, you say, hey, maybe we don't have to choose. Maybe when we're looking at the EU, there could be an ecosystem, you called it, which is very interesting and really connects to the two questions we already have in the chat, I think, for our next interveners. Wolfgang Perzold adds, you know, well, this is mostly examples from the local level. So how do we link levels and how do we think about the complications and risks that come from doing this at a, at a higher and at a supranational level. And, and David Wood uh, also asked the same similar question, uh, whether you, know, you all think you want to choose between one model. And of course, Eve also gave us two kind of types of models, the jury and the deliberative assemblies. So do we have to choose? Can we combine? And to which you want to add all of the questions that Claudia very elegantly threw at you at the end of her presentation on all the different dimensions that are raised. So I count on all of you uh, um, next speakers to each address whatever you, you think is most relevant, starting with David Farrell from Dublin. David. Thanks, Cliff. So it's such a, an honour to be involved in this, but also it's quite intimidating to follow Claudia and Eve. Um, I mean, Eve 
he he stressed the importance of following good precedent. And I suppose my main message as a friendly critic of deliberative mini publics, I'm a great supporter of deliberative mini publics, but I'm critical of this process, is to say the precedents that should be followed looking at Claudia's presentations are particularly those in Belgium. And also, I, you didn't have time, I know, but uh, Claudia, also the Scottish, I think are showing some very good precedents. I would be saying, follow Belgium, follow Scotland, don't follow Ireland. And I guess what, I, what I'm getting at here is a question of path dependency and the risk that when uh, systems start to get settled in and familiar to senior civil servants in particular, there's a risk that they know how to run it better than anybody else, or so they think. And so let me try and illustrate what I'm getting at in two or three minutes. Um, and I'll just look at a few dimensions here. But you can break the process of a deliberative mini public. It's common to do this into three stages, the input, setting it up, the throughput, the running of the deliberative process, and the output, what follows later. And I fear that what we're seeing play out in the Conference on the Future of Europe panels are, are serious weaknesses in all three of those stages. And it's unfortunate. And I really hope they don't let these weaknesses bed down. So in terms of the input, you know, look at the agenda. We know from best practice that the, an agenda should be simple, it should be straightforward, it should be ideally a single topic. Um, we can see from the French case, from the UK Climate Assembly, the risks of what happened if the agenda is too broad. Well, let me just give you the title of one of the panels of the Conference on Future of Europe. This is the agenda. This panel has to look at stronger economy, social justice, jobs, education, youth, culture, sport, digital transformation. I had to take a breath to complete that title. It is so long. And when you have an unrealistic title, then you get to the situation in terms of the agenda that in the throughput, there isn't enough time. We saw this in France and we saw this in the UK Climate Assembly, for example. They had to break into small topic groups, which breaks with what you should have in a proper deliberative process where the members should all be working together. Well, let me give you one illustration from personal experience as one of the expert witnesses uh, to the Conference on the Future of Europe to one of the panels. I was asked to talk about uh, steps to improve citizen participation through deliberative processes. I was given 10 minutes. It was 10 minutes for me to present a topic like that, how to involve citizens in deliberative processes. That was followed by a 10 minute discussion, a question and answer session. 20 minutes is not enough time to have the discussion about something so fundamentally important. And that was just one illustration. And what you get from that is a series of recommendations that I have no doubt will be produced that are full of unrealistic expectations because the members of those panels have not been given sufficient time or sufficient knowledge base to really develop a, a full set of considered recommendations. So it, you have the weakness and the throughput because there's not enough time, there's far too much to discuss, which means it makes it much easier in the output stage for the uh, senior politicians to ignore. Because if you have a series of unrealistic uh, recommendations, if they're unrealistic, why would you accept them? You will ignore them. So we get to the output stage. And we know from best practice in Belgium, as Claudia showed in part of her presentation, that what you need in the output stage is the possibility for a serious um, interrogation of the outputs of the citizens assembly and the possibility for the members of the citizens assembly to be involved in that discussion that follows. We'll look at what we're going to get in the output stage for the conference on the future of Europe. It goes to these plenaries, the plenaries which have almost 450 members as, as I counted, 18% 18% of the membership of the plenaries comprise the members of the citizens' panels. They won't have voice. It's impossible for them to have voice to be able to drive home their most important recommendations, which, as I've just mentioned, are likely to be full of unrealistic propositions because they weren't fully informed. So you get weakness in the input, the throughput, and the output. And the risk with that is that it endangers uh, the, the true deliberation that you really want, many of us would really want to see. So I'll finish where I started from. Please don't follow bad practice, follow best practice if this is to be allowed to bed down. Don't allow path dependency to set in, which means that the secretariat, the senior civil servants in charge, 
say that they know better than anybody else. They don't listen to the experts. And as a result, you produce something that is more tokenistic than realistic. Thanks. Thank you for this very forceful critique, David, which we need um, to hear. And indeed, I, I am now turning to Gabriella, who, Gabriella Cretu, who, um, who is um, part of this coffee process, but as uh, the only politician on our panel today. So bad practice, worst practice, Gabriella, where are we and what is to be done? Firstly, good evening and democratic thinking from Bucharest. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, dear friends, somebody once said that if we want a union able to defend all its citizens, we need sometimes to protect the union of, I quote now, the unbearable lack of realism of its elite. When it comes about the conference on the future of the Union, I played this role. A few general suppositions, firstly to avoid misunderstandings. I do believe that a genuine democracy is vital, including participatory. Replacing democratic, democratically supported policies and democratically controlled administration with a bureaucratic governance of society would result finally in a human failure. We cannot build is something. Do you hear me? Yeah, good, thank you. Uh, we cannot build a better society without, without direct involvement of citizens, but pay attention in politics, not to provide a kind of fake legitimacy to a knowledge some already own. At the same time, I strongly reject a confusion. The confusion between the possibility to express opinions and the necessity to be listened to on the one side and the capacity to contribute to decision-making and the possibility of really shaping our life. Between, you know, something like doxocracy, opiniocracy, as you wish to, know, to, to say, and democracy, they are different things. I consider that political consciousness of citizens, including European citizens, it is not born. It must be formed educated, and their individual political will must be integrated. It was the role of political parties, movements, to do so in modern democracies. Currently, the changing opinions are shaped mainly by mass media and new social media, or media cannot and must not shape the values we believe in, the interests we pursue, the dreams we want to fulfill. I have a serious reason to think so. I am a left winger. Those I used to represent don't have their TV channels, newspapers, and certainly they cannot control ideas, social media spread, because nobody can actually. They could be victims instead. Uh, the big European lobby cannot be allowed also to represent al almost 500 million uh, European citizens. 94% of those participating to European Commission public consultations are registered lobbyists. The other 6% are not, are not registered yet. Uh, Either so-called experts cannot speak for the others for a reason you know. The capital has always its experts to defend is, its positions as being scientific. Labor, unfortunately, have not or not enough. The alliance between middle educated class and lower strata of society has broken for long in many countries. I, I hope not everywhere. We need public intellectuals, as you are, I hope, to defend those who cannot, do not, 
and nobody asked them to speak for themselves. It is the same in the conference. Uh, those 60% almost of citizens who gave up voting don't participate to events and public consultation and anything. For empowering citizens, a process I deeply support, we need political parties. I am an active but, but worried uh, European federalist coming from the left, left side. The political parties have already been in deep crisis long before the decision of organizing this conference. If nothing essential changes by the end of the conference, the conference would be the stone on their grave, at least at the European level, because they have gave up to, the, to their responsibility of shaping the European citizens' mind. They are formally absent and political plural, 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 pluralism, I'm sorry, as well. European institutions have organized the conference. European institutions are important for the functioning, but nobody votes European institutions. If we still want to hold elections in the future, we cannot forget that people used to give or not their support to political parties, each of them coming with a different diagnosis of reality, with a different hierarchy of problems to be solved, values to be defended, and solutions based on and coherent with these values. Gabriella, if you can wrap up. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Yeah, I have to stop. No, if you can just wrap up in a few very quickly. Uh, so, uh, because of deep, deep level of integration and the complexity of our society, step by step method of the founding fathers cannot work anymore, a coherent project. And many, or many coherent projects uh, are necessary to discuss on. Uh, European Union doesn't face a democratic deficit more than national level faces a democratic deficit, but it faces other problems we have to put on the agenda and uh, at least to have a clear outcome. A convention, yeah. a list of policies, unnecessary reforms of some institutions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriella, for this passionate defense of including politics and political party. And David mentioned that some of us were, you know, experts in the process. And we did notice that in the Conference on the Future of Europe, party programs, the consciousness of how parties may disagree on questions with, is not really brought up. So the place of political parties in this permanent citizens assembly, how does it fit, should be a question that very much stays with us along with everything else that you've raised. So thank you very much, Gabriella. And now I now turn to Carsten for the last one in group one, and then we'll turn to group two. Group one, uh, Carsten. Yeah, thank you, Calypso. Thank you so much for the floor. I thought I'd report a little bit about my observations as a UI background fellow, because I have the privilege to actually take part not only in the plenary sessions of the conference, but also in the citizens panels and also in the subgroup. So um, as far as this is possible at this stage, uh, because it's not finalized, as we all know, I want to give you some preliminary uh, conclusions. So uh, this is a bit overlapping, sorry, uh, but a bit also different from what David said. Regarding the topic overload, that's uh, one of the biggest concerns I've been observing, has, has uh, several negative, uh, potentially dangerous implications, of course, and so far as citizens are fully uh, overwhelmed and also facilitators, yeah, there, there's fatigue because they have to deal with so many topics, they don't need to repeat all the different topics that David has mentioned already, but for the democracy topic itself, where we have one citizens panel, it's also already very large. So it's about European democracy, values, rights, uh, rule of law, and even European security. And uh, I'm, I must say, I'm really glad that that I must not moderate in such a panel. I was asked to do actually, and I've been uh, moderating in the German uh, parliament's uh, randomly selected citizens assembly, and I know what it means 
to work uh, effectively when you have two people, a moderator and a note taker, even that that's not ensured in the citizens panels. That's uh, very trivial, actually, but it is simply not there yet. So I, we immediately, uh, I immediately proposed this to the conference secretariat, and I hope it will be ensured in the last session this week in Florence. Secondly, um, the deliberations cannot be, of course, uh, high quality if you have so many topics, and uh, they cannot be as sharp uh, as they must be. Yeah? And, um, and uh, the, 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 th the third point is, of course, that you will have in the end many recommendations and uh, that then decision makers in the end can really are invited to, to for 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 cherry picking yeah and and that's exactly what we what we observe with many citizens assemblies across the world in france the claudia you mentioned the brilliant case with the climate um, convention you only had 10 percent implemented with the constitutional um, conventions in ireland you have about 18 percent only implemented uh, so, so, so this is, is is very worrying, and we need to think about uh, how to make these citizens' uh, assemblies more effective, not only in terms of clear-cut recommendations, but also in terms of implementation. And then I think that's the main reason why we are meeting here today, to really get an institutionalized and permanent form of citizens' assemblies that they really have an effect. Second point, uh, very short, the selection of participants is very one-sided, I would say. Even so, it is inclusive in terms of age, gender, origin of geography, socioeconomic classes. And there, um, Gabriela, I would slightly uh, contradict you. We have people on board who are not uh, elites, so to say, the 94% you mentioned would usually take part in consultations. You also have very sim simple people, whatever that means, um, so from lower strata. And, uh, and, and they, they can deliberate originally these under ideal conditions with sufficient time, with sufficient expertise, and they're even compensated financially with 70 euros per day so that they can actually participate. So it is quite inclusive. But in my view, it is not inclusive. Uh, it is not sufficiently inclusive. We need we need to also involve certain attitudes so that we do not only have the people who are biased in terms of pro-European. Uh, we also need the EU skeptics and the EU critical people, and we also need to much more need to much more involve the the marginalized groups, people with uh, migration background, people with no EU passport, people with, uh, with from certain minorities. We need to have a minority. Uh, or inclusiveness, um, how do you call it, Pol policy officer, so to say, who is, who is involved in that, as civil society is actually, and if I strongly underline your point, civil society needs to be involved in that. As civil society has, has said so often, we need to be more inclusive, just as in this session, also the panel that must be much more less white, I would say, and that's also true um, for, for the conference. It is blind in color, so, so to say. And uh, last point um, regarding the selection of the experts, I would say uh, it is it is uh, very boring um, how certain topics seem to be marginalized. Uh, I always bring this example when I was in a subgroup and a participant asked uh, the expert, he was a former cabinet chef of the commission president, uh, what do you think about direct citizens voting uh, on EU affairs? And he immediately said, there's no competence for that, and I'm against it, and full stop, next, next over. Uh, let's go to the next topic. That, that's not a problem uh, to be against direct citizens voting, not at all in a deliberative um, uh, assembly, but if you don't have a counter position, then it's becoming a problem because then it's very one-sided. So this was in the very first phase of the ECP2, and then the second phase, uh, where we worked on orientations, we had these uh, wonderful experts. Everyone was a great expert, uh, including- Preston. Just Sorry, wrap, yeah, I, wrap I, I wrap up. So, so then again, the expert, there was no real expert who has published on direct democracy and who is up to date on the real, these kind of things Claudia has mentioned, how to possibly connect uh, citizen assemblies uh, uh, with direct democracy at EU level. There, there's so much literature, but it was simply not provided. So in order to solve this, we need an advisory expert group, as is the case in my home state uh, in, in, in Germany, where you have an advisory board who is exactly discussing all the questions of how to organize the topic, the topics, the selection of participants, the selections of the experts. And that is that means for me implementation uh, um, permanent institutionalization of citizens assemblies and I uh, that's my last sentence, I really. Um, really also under recommend that we look at the Eastern Belgian model which several of us, including myself have been co designing 
And I would also not forget about the Irish model, David, because of course it's not institutionalized and there are many problems regarding output and, and impact. But you have the wonderful case that you have reached to the entire citizenry, yeah, the entire uh, population of the, of the Republic of Ireland. Here, usually uh, citizen assemblies are top down and hardly anyone gets to know about it simply because it is not connected to any other form of democracy as such. And that, that is what I would love to go into deeper as Claudia has suggested these different models, how to really reach out to, 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 the, to the citizens through direct democracy procedures in combination with citizen assemblies. Uh, I, I'm such a shame that this apparently seems not to become a topic in the ECPs, even so it's on the table. And let's don't forget about this, the entire reason why we have the conference. Let's the last point is largely connected to the fact that it was rejected by citizens in many member states, and that is traumatized. And we need to overcome this trauma in terms of uh, also discussing direct citizens' participation. Sorry for being so long. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you, Garsten, and for mentioning also East Belgium, because I'm now turning to group two that is going to try to draw from all this critique and elements that you've all given to kind of give us a, uh, their sense of where to go with this permanent citizen assembly. and. Chris, Christoph Nissen, who is a um, uh, UI Max Weber fellow, new generation, has experience in the Belgian case and others. So um, the floor is yours, Christoph. Thank you, Calypso. And thanks also to all the other speakers for the very interesting insights. And well, in this case, I will try to live up to the expectation raised, meaning try to inform the debate with two points that I could draw from the German speaking Belgian experience that I actually think can be useful for our considerations here. And I would after that like to close with a more broader reflection that I had listening now to two of these forums. My first point is related to the tension that has been mentioned also by Eve in his expose between independence and connection of this process. Because in the German speaking case, what I think works not too badly is that first, you have a deliberation of citizens among themselves that get to know each other, that get to know the topic, that get knowledgeable, provide expertise, think about certain recommendations that they would like to come up with. And once they are empowered, once they have a certain uh, own expertise on the topic, they get to meet the politicians and there is a second round of deliberation if you want. And there is an actual connection between on the one hand the citizens and the elites. That is useful in two respects, I think. First, so that both groups understand each other. And secondly, to ensure some kind of follow-up because the politicians have understood why the citizens came up with the recommendations and they've understood why they did so and they have a, a collective engagement process. And then you will ask, but why don't you bring them together at first hand? Well, because I think first this socialization and individual empowerment process among citizens first is quite an important moment and has proven so in the past in the German speaking experience and might something might be something that also for a permanent European citizen assembly we might want to consider. My second point relates more to the consideration of scale that uh, Carsten has been also partially touching upon and for example in the German speaking case the population is very small. You only have 77,000 people there and the actual likelihood for one citizen to be drawn by lot once in a lifetime is about 60%. So it's actually more likely for a citizen to be selected once in his lifetime than not. And this obviously on the European scale is more difficult, but nothing prevents us to think about this in a broader term and not only to have one permanent EU citizen assembly, but to have broader, diverse parallel running processes. And this would come back to Claudia's point about the ecosystems. And you can have different innovations, you can have different processes and you could collect it to more direct models like Karsten was suggesting, but this is something that we actually also find very important to not forget that our process here is at first about few people. And if you really want to touch the democratic malaise that we are currently experiencing, we need, need to think how we can scale this up to a much broader, uh, a much broader range. And then I would like to conclude with a more general reflection that has striked me uh, now that I've been here at different forums. Last week, for example, we have been hearing um, the testimony of politicians who said we are legitimate because we are elected and this is something very important. We have heard stakeholders saying we are the ones with expertise, we are connected to the ground, this is why we are legitimate. And we have heard citizens saying we are independent and we are diverse, this is why we are legitimate and this is why we should be there. But there's been quite a bit of a clash to some extent or between narratives on who is uh, legitimate and not. And while I think that this kind of testimony brings us or lets me draw two main implications in the case of a 
of a permanent model, something that I would hope is on the one hand that we are careful about this and design a, a process that takes care of all these different interests and does not forget about how these all different democratic legitimacies are competing. But I think that in addition to the more immediate deliberate output that a permanent European citizen assembly could have, something more systemic and meta deliberative that actually could come out from this is that it challenges us to have a more societal debate about what is legitimacy, about how we take our political decisions. And if we make the step to institutionalization and to permanency, I think this can be something really interesting for the broader public debate about how our political decisions are taken. These would be my, my main three points. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Christophe. And this last point on uh, the systemic effect is back also to Gabriella's point about the condition education and some of Claudia's point about the conditions for such assemblies to work. And so we, 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 we're kind of thinking about mm, at the EU level, it's such a challenge. It's a bigger challenge than at the local level, however important the local level is. Um, so another constraint that Claudia had uh, given us is the kind of legal institutional constraint of the EU, support by the EU civil servants, the EU politicians. But I just now want to turn to, um, to Alberto to tell us a bit more about how to deal with the existing EU system and how do you bring about a permanent citizen assembly? Alberto. Thank you, Calypso. Hello, everyone. Um, I belong to, to those who actually believe that the best legacy of the conference in the future of Europe could be some forms of institutionalization of, of mini publics into the European institutional architecture. That's something I've been trying to work on, like many of you, and also discussing among themselves. I don't necessarily have a blueprint. I think nobody has uh, ready uh, to, to present on how this European mini public should look like. But I think there are some refle preliminary reflections that are needed and that might build on as a reaction to what other speakers have been saying. I think the first consideration to be made is that when compared with other democratic innovations, uh, such as, for instance, participatory budgeting, the institutionalization of deliberative mini publics is the exception, it's not the norm. We've heard uh, of a few models uh, from, from Claudia, from Eve. But there are just a few as compared to the overall number of ad hoc exercises of, of mini publics. And probably none of these models of institutionalization lend itself to be used in the EU uh, as they stand, but they are very likely due to the path dependency, I like it by David Farrell, to play a significant role. So we need to unpack them further to study and possibly to mix them by adding some further elements of creativity and also addressing some of the institutional constraints of the union that make the EU very different uh, when looking at the role that mini public could play into it. Um, in particular, I think uh, even upstream of the question of how do we design that model would be what is the added value uh, that a citizens assembly uh, could bring to the European Union institutional and constitutional architecture today. And I think this is the question where we should spend more time on. We all know that after 70 years of integration, uh, it is no exaggeration to say that European to be somehow marginalized um, at different levels, not only in the day to day, but also in constitution making. And the post Lisbon dual democratic system, representative plus participatory democracy, didn't necessarily deliver. And that's probably why we have a conference on the future today to address partly uh, the insuccess of this dual model. So when we look at the conference and the perspective of institutionalizing the public today, I think it is pretty clear that a European permanent mini public, uh, which might be designed in a different way, uh, could be quite unique in bringing citizens at the heart of decision making, European decision making, a pretty inclusive, representative, and informed manner uh, in a way that uh, is qualitatively different than any other participatory channel experience so far. Uh, as we all said today, uh, there's no doubt the citizens we all met acting as expert or observing and sitting in those panels are very different than the one we have been meeting in the corridors of the European Parliament or those who have been mobilizing the European citizen initiatives or filing petitions. They are certainly more diverse. So this potential for diversities and a greater diversity remains significant and remains important. And I think it is against this backdrop and against this potential that we have to think how can we shift uh, from this ad hoc exercise, such as the Conference on the Future of Europe, to legally available structure uh, of a mini public? Because saying permanent, uh, it doesn't mean necessarily that it has to be there all the time. 
And I think uh, we have seemed to be very much on the same page about thinking more of a participatory ecosystem of assemblies uh, as opposed to one assembly always being there on duty. Uh, we are rather thinking of a system of, of on demand uh, whereby in certain policy issues, in certain instances, we could imagine the citizens to come in. Uh, I've been spending some time thinking about the different models uh, that could uh, potentially come in. Um, they, uh, there are different variables that I think we need to, to consider uh, when looking at how to design a European uh, citizens assembly. I think the first one has to do uh, with the legal principle of institutional balance, this idea that this panel cannot uh, affect the uh, distribution of powers and therefore competencies existing at, among the European institutions. What is the relationship uh, between the citizens panel input and the existing participatory channels, such as the right of petition or the European citizens assembly, but also the idea of the scoping. Should this citizens assembly be up on duty to discuss about any policy issue or just some specific one, like uh, Marcus Patberg idea of a citizens assembly just focusing on constitution making, for instance, but not dealing with other policy issues. Uh, what about the tasks? Uh, should this citizens assembly have some agenda setting role or simply playing some scrutiny role? Um, at what point uh, of the policy cycle, this citizens assembly should play a role? Right upstream, even before the European Commission is called upon to prepare a proposal, during uh, the preparation of this proposal in parallel to a public consultation or at later stage when the commission proposal is actually sent to the parliament commission here the model coming from the brussels parliament of deliberative parliamentary uh, uh, committees is very interesting and it cannot be necessarily ruled, ruled out and finally two variables the composition composition um, should it be only citizens or should we rather imagine a more hybrid one in which we would have citizens uh, uh, mixed with political representatives, uh, as we are experiencing now with, with the plenary. And, and finally, the, the tricky question, uh, which should be the authority uh, entrusted uh, to this uh, citizens panel in the EU should be merely advisory, or they should actually have a, a greater role. And I think this is where the major legal constraints would, would emerge. It would be very difficult under the current treaty uh, to imagine a system in which a citizens assembly could actually dictate uh, to, on the other European institutions what they could actually do. And that's why, and I'm coming to a close on my recommendations, um, I think the system which is more plausible, more realistic, and also more in line uh, with the current available literature and previous experiences would be a model of a European deliberative agenda setting model. In, in other words, a system where the citizens assembly would actually have a say on a variety of, of inputs that might be coming from the commission, the European council, a European citizen initiative, the council of the European Union, and basically express themselves upon an idea uh, that has already emerged in the policy cycle. Um, this model is mm. something that we could potentially accommodate already now uh, through an interinstitutional agreement and which could we experiment uh, also uh, beyond uh, the conference on the future of Europe itself. Back to you, Calypso. Uh, thank you, Alberto. And it's indeed important to stress in the kind of principle of real reality and pragmatism that some of what we're talking about doesn't require treaty change, could happen. Uh, maybe not overnight, but quickly. Uh, but we first need to have a real discussion about all of these variables that you point out and other speakers have spoken about. So last but not least, I turn to Nicolo, who uh, speaks including in the name of CTOE, which has worked very much on this, uh, on developing a blueprint, its own blueprint for a citizens assembly. So Nicolo. Thanks, Calypso. Um... Look at the end of this. At the end of this discussion, I want to make five uh, points as synthetically as I can. Um, the first is, I think that the European Union um, is not uh, is not subject any more to a democratic deficit than uh, other levels of government. But I think it needs to work harder to address the democratic deficit that um, it suffers from for multiple reasons. The difficulty of bringing together people over such a big territory in different languages, its distance from the citizens and so on. So it needs to work harder, but conversely, the prize, if it gets addressing the democratic deficit right, is much bigger. It's the prize of creating uh, transnational 
democracy. And that um, is very much, I think, the challenge of a citizens' assembly. The European Union cannot ignore the deliberative wave uh, that is sweeping across the world. Indeed, it's not ignoring the deliberative wave. Um, this discussion about how the European Union is going to do participation is there and it's happening. For me, really the crucial question is who is involved in that discussion and who is setting the, the course of the way the European Union is going to do participative democracy in the future. Because if it's not the right people, the danger is it's something extremely symbolic and tokenistic, which will just make the problem worse. So I think that uh, permanent citizens assembly needs to be a genuine pillar of the European uh, Union. That's the first point. And it needs, I think, in order to answer the challenge, um, it needs to have a seat, a symbolic seat. Uh, for me, that would be uh, in Strasbourg. You might need to change the furniture inside of the parliament in Strasbourg because it's not very well suited for citizen deliberation. But I think symbolically, uh, that would send a very clear signal that uh, the European Union believes in citizen participation. If that uh, acts as a stimulus for the European Parliament to be more ambitious and, for example, to make transnational political parties, I would be absolutely delighted. That would be virtuous competition between institutions. I'm a strong believer in political parties as well. Secondly, I don't think that the fact it would have a permanent seat needs to mean it doesn't move around. I would see that an ecosystem could very well have a kind of fulcrum in the permanent citizens assembly, but could be running activities, running deliberations all across Europe, linking up with other citizens assemblies, other deliberative processes. Um, and so I don't think there's necessarily an antithesis between having one place and doing things across Europe. That's the second point. Third point, and perhaps the most important one, is that uh, it really is for me a question of who is running the process. And so I think we have to see co-creation of the rules, procedures of how a citizens assembly, of how citizen deliberation and participation works in the European Union as essential, co-creation with the citizens so that there's not a civil service or a set of politicians over here designing the rules of how these things work. And then the citizens just being brought in to play their role, but rather a real process of co-creation and therefore also learning um, that goes on. Why not have not only sortition for the participants in the Citizens' Assembly deliberation, but also sortition for some other roles uh, in how the Citizens' Assembly is governed, um, so that there's not this kind of path dependency of, uh, of, uh, of a civil service that feels like it, it knows how these things work and can run it from behind. Um, fourthly, I think that however a European Citizens' Assembly is designed, it will not be perfectly representative. Uh, and it will always be, and always should be, in some way contested. I think it having a seat uh, so people can see and touch it will help with that. It will help social movements to come in and express its problems with what's going on in the European Citizens' Assembly and for others to express their discontent. And that's exactly how it should be. And that will be one of the ways that a Citizens' Assembly uh, would learn. And lastly, I will for once slightly differ from Alberto's emphasis that I think that for me, the priority of where a Citizens' Assembly would come into the European uh, policy cycle would actually be to address what I see as a great weakness in the current policy cycle, which is the accountability of those people who take decisions. Uh, it's very unclear, I think, for most European citizens who takes decisions in the European Union and how they're held accountable in front of a public for the decisions that they've taken. So for me, uh, a citizens' assembly would really target at uh, that moment in the policy cycle, rather than being at the agenda setting phase. But of course, I have a maximalist position concerning the European Citizens Assembly. I'd like to see it involved in many stages, but I'm just saying that's where I would start. Thanks Thank very much. Thank you so much, Nicolo. And I like this term maximalist. So we have the minimalists who just want a footnote Citizen Assembly and the maximalist. 
Um, very few, nobody's expressed themselves purely against right now. So I wouldn't mind if somebody dared in this um, call to do such a thing, you know, in the name of traditional politics, lots of good arguments on the other side too. But without further ado, first of all, I'd just like to note that there's quite a lot of chit chat in the chat. Um, and that's great. I would also, since we are in the chat, um, seeing this chat, I'd like to say that if those of you feel so inspired, please turn on your camera so that this call be a bit more feeling of deliberative. A sub question might be how do you do deliberation, you know, on screen, because we will be living in a hybrid world for the time to come. So please don't hesitate turning on your camera so we can see each other a bit. Um, and I, I see um, already quite a few hands, uh, and many of you, and some of you have written in the chat, Michele, Fiorillo, you've, you've uh, put your hand up, but also a lot in the chat. So, and then I'll turn to Michael St. Clair, Katarina, and Tony, and then Jamie. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Calypso, to organize this uh, very much needed seminar, bringing many people are reflecting uh, since long time now about this opportunity to have a new type of institution as uh, uh, lately Nicolò just, uh, just, uh, just said, also having uh, a seat. So that I think it's very important is the work we are doing also with the coalition of 50 uh, and more than 50 NGO from all over Europe, uh, Citizen Takeover Europe. Um, we, we brought together some practitioner and uh, uh, expert of the Liberative and Citizen Assemblies, the Liberative Democracy Citizen Assemblies. Some of them are, are here with us and others uh, uh, probably will come in a work that, uh, as it's it is clear this evening, uh, is, has just started um, or started before the, the the, the start of the Conference on the Future of Europe before the experiment of the citizen panels. And now is seeing this experiment going on and drawing some uh, possibilities for the future. What I think it, it's important uh, um, to, to be conscious is uh, something that uh, I think Alberto was referring to. It's the fact that uh, this Conference on the Future of Europe, this citizen panels experiment and a possible uh, European Citizen Assembly as a permanent institution is part uh, of the creation or the building up uh, of an European demos, who's, which is uh, the element that was always uh, underlined as uh, uh, something lacking to have a proper European transnational democracy. Uh, in that respect, uh, in some of the debates we, we, we had uh, also lately last Thursday publicly uh, discussing the um, um, uh, how, in fact, uh, to design a, a European Citizen Assembly as an institution, uh, some of the features we uh, more or less uh, uh, agreed in the past and again in, in this uh, Tuesday debate is that to represent uh, a diverse uh, European society, you need more than, uh, you need at least 300, 350 people. We, we have written this in the guidelines for uh, the European Citizen Assembly before the start of the citizen panels. But personally, I think uh, maybe also symbolic, we need at least 500 people up to 1,000 people. And you could, of course, also use a sortition and also have uh, some representation of diversity also beyond the sortition in, with different levels probably. Also, the, we had the discussion with uh, um, some of the organizers of the current citizen panels and this idea of an ecosystem was very much uh, also raised up in this kind of debates. The fact that probably this European citizen assembly could be conce conceived as a sort of House of deliberation and sortition, to call like that. So, something that uh, has uh, different tools, uh, different modality, using much of also of the experiments that uh, Claudia and OECD are cataloging uh, step after step, uh, and, uh, and they, they should be used at the best level. Uh, so David now was saying, use the best practice, not the, the worst practice. Uh, at the transnational level to develop uh, at best this transnational mm. democracy. Just to think, think uh, no. uh, very, very fast, 
it, I think it's important also to think to the Europe beyond the European unions, all the citizens, they were, uh, uh, they were uh, European citizens like uh, the, the friends from uh, UK, or they want to become European Union citizens as the friend of the uh, Eastern Partnership or Mediterranean Partnership, and probably also uh, the world. So we, we have a bit to, to think also how an itinerant citizen assembly with a seat in Strasbourg, in Brussels, uh, could uh, also take place inside the European Union, in the parliaments, in the city councils sometime, and also outside the European Union as an instrument of democratic hegemony. I finish it. Thank you. Thank you, Michele, and for bringing in the other, Europe's others, who should definitely find their place in this process without calling ourselves a model, of course. I'd like to stress two things. One is that, um, uh, well, Katerina, who has her hand up, actually was one of the first comments in the chat um, citing a woman, Rosa Luxemburg, as the first thinker of, on, of some proto version of Citizens Assembly. Uh, but I, in the spirit of inclusiveness, I'd like to encourage women in this call to also raise their hand because this is very gendered at the moment. Uh, I know, Gabriella, you have your hand up. And I also would like to encourage everyone else to put things in the chat, but only please if you can speak for a very short time, because at the end, I would like to give our speakers a chance to come back and we need to finish at seven. So very short interventions, please. Um, thank you. Michael Sinclair. Um, hello there from London, everyone. I've been working on citizens assemblies through DM25 for the last four to five years. And um, the first point I'd like to make I'd like to agree with David Farrell. You cannot ever say things too simply enough. Communication and dialogue are so important in these matters, and people tend to speak in verse. I hope I don't. While, uh, while citizens' assemblies are common, there are any number of them all over the world at any time. Uh, as long as they are not legally binding to a parliament, they are arguably, as they are, only a useful vent for governments to allow people to express amongst themselves without any obligation by the government to act upon the findings. The second point I'd like to make is that the action, the action of voting is an endorsement of whatever political institutional design exists in that country. And it's the political institutional design that benefits the politics and politicians, but disenfranchises people. The third point I'd like to make is that in order for us all in our lives to be effective, we want an effective system. And I would argue that citizen assemblies need to be an adjunct of parliaments, an adjunct of parliaments all around the world, so that we're not left with party politics and um, confrontation, adversity politics. And I think probably all of us here today know this, which is why we're talking about uh, citizens assemblies but for them to really be, for, the, for them to really work they have to be legally binding upon a parliament or else they will just pass thank you thank you michael and I, and i note that um we we might have some difference of view between speakers on the role of politics and parties in this system, because we, after all, agonistic, democracy is agonistic, it is about conflict. So whether or not it's organized along party line, partisan line, ideological line or other lines, it will always be there and how it's articulated, parties might have a role to play there. But I'm now turning to Katazina. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Katarzyna Naklimowicz and I represent uh, the Berlin-based organization Citizens for Europe, with which I coordinated, among others, the um, European Democracy Network and Democratic Innovation in Youth Work projects, which were, by the way, funded by the European Commission. 
I also work as an uh, expert uh, and conduct uh, research on democratic innovations, such as citizens assemblies. And I would like to, first of all, uh, thank you for a very interesting discussion for uh, arranging this meeting. And following um, to what has been already said, I would like to draw uh, particular attention to the issue of inclusion and equal opportunity uh, for people who decided or were uh, forced by various circumstances to live in a different country than their birthplace or their formal nationality indicates. Um, this is something that is uh, mostly professional, but actually refers also to my personal situation. Hence my question uh, also in the chat was whether the idea of creating a permanent citizens assembly also includes a solution how to technically enable the participation of all of the European Union residents, not on the basis of uh, nationality, but simply the current place of residence. And um, I think that this is very important because of the transnational dimension of the initiative um, and the situation of uh, people who are often discriminated and deprived of basic political rights in their place of residence uh, because the le legal regulations are uh, most often based on the, in my view, um, uh, rather outdated concept of nation state and nationality and not on the actual situation in which uh, these people find themselves. So I also believe that this would be uh, consistent with uh, encouraging so much uh, mobility uh, for all uh, within the European Union and uh, also beyond its so-called uh, borders. Why I ask is also because even to register for this event, I also had to give my formal, formal nationality. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, not everyone uh, identifies uh, so, um, always uh, with this uh, formal nationality and uh, especially after many years of living in different countries, uh, we're so uh, interconnected. And I think that uh, this is like a really important uh, thing we should stress uh, when designing the new uh, system based on citizen activity. Thank you. Thank you, Katarzyna. I can't, I can't vouch for the EUI uh, website registration, but I very much hope and believe that this, this requirement is, is not ideological or you know, nation-centric in that view, in that sense, but rather a, a technical requirement because we're with you on, on this question of inclusiveness, which has been a really big issue discussed in our EUI Democracy Forum and, and comes in in all sorts of different ways. Um, quite a challenge indeed. So now I, 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 I turn to Tony, who I know works on these issues, including with the Federal Trust. So, Tony. So, Tony, you're muted. You're muted. Tony? Um, thank you, Calypso, and thank you, organizers, for this very timely and important event. As it happened, the last uh, Monday, I've had in, uh, a seminar on almost precisely the same subject. It was titled Citizen Senate towards a, <clears throat> a, a consensual presidential democracy. Now, uh, <clears throat> I would like rather to refer to what Claudia was proposing in her last slide to summarize what I'd like to say very briefly. And she referred to three points, the purpose, the form, and the relationship between the parliament. To that, I would add the way in which this proposal should be implemented and the timeline. And I start with the, with the way in with which it should be implemented. In my view, it shouldn't demolish the existing system. We simply haven't got the time. We have to ask very, act very, very fast. So that is my first premise. We should rather reuse the pillars of, uh, of which uh, Nicola was mentioned, of the existing system and add perhaps one, one extra, which is the, the citizens uh, assembly, which you call the parliament. I, in my view, it was the citizen senate semi parliament. It makes no, no difference in the end. Uh, so that's the first one. 
The second one is the purpose. The long-term purpose, I think, should be to merge the best elements of direct representative and presidential democracy. And in my presentation, which is available on the YouTube, I explain how and why it should be done. The uh, third point regards the forms. And here I- Sorry, propose... Tony, you can't do a whole presentation because no, we no, have no, so little no. time. So just- No, no, yeah. I'm just, I'm just mm, okay. two Thank minutes of, at most. The, uh, the, the third point is about the, the form. Uh, it should be the, the citizens' assembly, uh, as you suggest, uh, a permanent or, or semi-permanent. But <clears throat> I, would, I would suggest to use the existing petition system, but reinforced with a much higher level of entry um, so that those randomly selected, uh, so if the petition is valid, it would trigger a session of the citizens' assembly. So the citizens' assembly would only operate triggered by a petition at the very high level, so 5% of the voters. Why? Because we cannot paralyze the system, the politics, the government has to govern. So it can only be on the exceptional and very important matters. The second point is that as, um, as Michael has, has pointed some some other people, that it should be binding. In order for this to be binding, it has to be in a kind of a draft legislation. The product of the assembly should be the draft legislation. Therefore, they should be advised by the lawyers and other advisors. Now, regarding the- um, Sorry, Tony, timeline, but I have to ask you to conclude because- The final point is about the please. timeline. We simply haven't got the time because everything that you, if you observe around happens in almost exponential change. So we don't have a decade. We have just a few more years and we have to utilize to use this conference so that it ends up with the, one of the key proposals to establish what most of these speakers have proposed today. Thank you. Well, it is, it, the issue of binding comes back and yet in the, in the, in the chat, we see Claudia coming back with um, a purely agenda setting, echoing Alberto. So here is another tension in the conversation um, that we that we are having. So I now turn uh, to Gerald, Jamie, Karin. I'm now really, really insisting on one minute. Gabriella, you, you please do intervene now, but I'll give you a minute to each speaker at the end at uh, eight minutes before the end. But if you prefer to speak now, that's fine too. Go, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to stress something. We have many politically elected parliaments almost powerless because of many essential decision about being excluded for, from uh, the democratic process. Many independent authorities, uh, decisions concerning financial and monetary issues, must require arbitrary criteria preventing to choose budgetary deficit needed, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, because of interest of large categories not being represented, truly. We have an European Parliament without full legislative initiative and the Council deciding against many times the mandate received from their national parliaments. And we want another randomly selected powerless parliament rotating every month, every six months, it would be worse than in old democracies because every representative, at least now, at least theoretically, has behind the party with organizations able to collect opinions and explain to citizens the reasons of different decisions. And not to forget, democracy is a matter, it's a matter of trust. We cannot ask each and every citizen, even empowered, to know everything and to decide on everything, including very specific topics. But we need to rebuild the parties and to rebuild trust. Thank you for these sobering thoughts, Gabriella. And I very quickly now, and literally very quickly, uh, Gerald. No, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Sorry, we can't hear you. I'm going to have to turn to Jamie now. 
uh, who is the coordinator of our forum and has been very much um, helping to engineer these events. Um, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Philip. So yeah, I can see we're running out of time, so I'll keep myself you know, as brief as I possibly can. Um, you know, part of my background sitting on this call is like, you know, I have a background in journalism and communications. And so I find it very interesting to be following the kind of micro public discussion, the technicalities of what this citizens assembly might look like. Personally, I'm also very interested in this macro public, the bigger outreach that the citizenship as a whole would have in relation to the citizens assembly that we're imagining as a permanent institution. And looking at this process of the conference on the future of Europe that we are in the midst of, one of the things that really struck me was the kind of lack of attention that was paid to the digital platform, which was an interesting effort to kind of outreach to a larger citizen citizenship as part of the agenda setting that the citizen panelists we're now seeing will be speaking to. I wonder why that happened. Why was there this kind of deafness within the media space? And what is the interface that could happen between this macro public, the public as a whole, and the micro publics that would be involved in this assembly? Uh, so one proposition I might have is, you know, at the end of this conference as part of the, 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 the ideas of where the energies that will be creating this permanent institution might come from, why not make the use of this platform? Why, why, why don't we have a permanent digital citizens platform uh, that we debate properly in the media that we can intervene in by making some of these technical conversations we're having now accessible to a wider public? Um, and I think I'll stop there because we're, we, we haven't got much time. So thank you, Calypso. Oops. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. A, a very important issue that need, would deserve a whole, a whole conversation by itself. Karen. Hi. So you asked for women's point of view. So I will have a few uh, sobering points, maybe. So the first thing I think is remembering why we're doing, why we would have this uh, permanent citizens uh, assembly. And I think that we are EU experts, so we immediately think about EU legitimacy. However, the main point I think is that we're facing, we are facing a lot of crises which have implications as far as social, just, social and distributive justice is, are concerned. So we have hard political choices to make. And if we don't involve citizens, it will increase the divide in societies that we're currently seeing. So if you start by that, and adding to the necessity of having trust and solidarity, you then see the point of having this kind of uh, assembly. Second sobering point, and it's a reaction to what I've heard. From my minimum humble work with some national MPs, and you will know MPs, and you will know where I come from, so you can see what kind of MPs I've been working on, but also MEPs, I think once upon a time, uh, members of parliament were supposed to be normal citizens. So I don't see really a problem with having an assembly made out of citizens. Not only that, but indeed, based on my experience, there are a lot of MPs uh, um, of whom you can wonder what their qualification are. And I think this profession, the professionalization of politics is a question. And this also gives some argument in favor of having the citizens assembly. The last point is what to do next. So of course, I hope you will do a blueprint. And more importantly, I think if, if you were to find uh, the, um, uh, some allies in the, uh, among the MEPs, they could uh, give a, a signal for the birth of this informal citizen assembly. And if you could, can give, uh, could get the, the backup of the French presidency and the German coalition who are in favor of uh, the conference on the future of Europe, you would be able to have an assembly with quite some legitimacy. And the point of all that would be to have the commission commit to take into consideration automatically what the citizen assembly would be uh, producing for uh, bringing up a legislative uh, proposals. Voila, I would stop there. Uh, thank you, Karen. And this is also very constructive because I think the next conversation we will have in the spring is, is much more how to get there. Political coalitions, alliances, who and how to choose between all the variants that we've discussed. And we're seeing in the chat right now some disagreement about bottom up versus top down, ver ver whether some models like Oz Belgium is the best, who should um, be doing the agenda setting. 
So clearly, you know, we, it, it was never, this meeting was never about coming to some sort of consensus of blueprint, as many of you have said. But I'd like now to give an opportunity to our different speakers. Gabriella has already given her wise words of conclusion. But if I can ask uh, any of you uh, in whatever order, let's make it bottom up democratic. Um, speakers to just uh, unmute yourself and um, and just say if you if you want uh, a concluding word and in the meanwhile I also uh, want to alert everyone that I did put a couple of links of our democracy forum in the chat including one which has some of our resources um, that we are posting and updating on a constant basis um, so it might be useful also to follow things uh, but in the meanwhile, who among the speakers would like to, um, uh, to, to, uh, Alberto, you're, you're running in the chat. So did you want to say something? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think there is a very important point we have been discussing today that has to do with this mandatory nature of the mini public output. So there's a sort of expectation that unless we make the, um, the mini public output uh, mandatory for the representatives, the mini publics are basically uh, destined not to work. Uh, so we make it as a precondition for their effectiveness. But I think this um, probably lies on, on a misunderstanding. The fact that mini publics up to now actually worked because they managed to be complementary to representative democracy by triggering and prompting dynamics that oblige the representative position themselves and to advance the political conversation. Make it mandatory, it would basically mean to question the very notion of representativeness. We would expect a system in which the political system has to mechanically represent what the citizens have discussed. So why should representatives be there in the first place? Obviously, I'm caricaturalizing a little bit, but I think this is the key. These are the terms to the discussion we are having today. And virtually no system in the world has a mini public whose output has to be taken into account substantively and not procedurally only uh, by decision makers. So probably we need some clarity also on, on this conversation among, among us. But your point, Alberto, does raise the question of what we mean by representation, which is where Eve started us off from the very beginning. That is, are we really saying that representativeness is with only with traditional politics, or are we talking about another mode of representation, a kind of descriptive representation, etc.? So maybe, maybe it's fair and right to question the, <laughs> the issue of representativeness, but the, the other point you're raising, a clearly binding versus uh, non-binding or uh, has been one of the threads in this conversation. And it is linked to what the Conference on the Future of Europe um, can or should do. We are having this conversation in general, of course, in the abstract, would this be a good thing for Europe? But we also have the reality principle of asking, hmm, what do we hope the COFI will do? And of course, this question of bindingness uh, might be the make or break of this proposal, that if, if people insist that it's about binding, binding decisions, then this is another game altogether. Um, so now, uh, I, um, Chris, you wanted to jump in. Christoph Neeson. Thanks a lot, Caleb. So now we'll be short. Uh, related to the point that was just made, I think there are two forms of bindingness that we should keep in mind. There is bindingness of implementation and there is bindingness of follow-up. And if we agree that the European Citizen Assembly will not, maybe not be the best possible design as a first shot, maybe not making it immediately binding will also put some pressure on the process. And having a follow-up bindingness will, on the one hand, ensure that citizens need to feel, listen, and there is an actual connection to the system. But in the meanwhile, the Citizen Assembly can evolve. We can experiment with the system up until a point where we are satisfied and could transition to a more implementation bindingness, if we can call it that way. But I think sometimes to also allow the process to evolve and not to put too much pressure on himself on the process. I mean, uh, maybe one may want to be more careful in the first instance. That would be my point. And in fact, what you're talking about, Chris, is democracy as justification. If you have to follow up by agreeing or not, you're, you're, um, you're providing justification, not necessarily accepting the decision of the citizens. And that's very important. Um, Claudia. 
Yeah, thanks, Clip. So I just wanted to come in very quickly on what Alberta was just saying, actually, which is not something that we opened up in the discussion about at all, because I, I actually I actually disagree with him on this point. I think that often we talk about these deliberative processes as new forms of participation. And I mean, I also put my hands up because the area of work I lead at the OECD is called innovative citizen participation. So I feel like it's part of the problem almost. Um, I personally find the work of, of political theorists like Helen Lanmore and Mark Warren, who conceptualize these as new forms of representation to be actually a more apt way of thinking about this because I think that the people who are selected by civic lottery to be part of a citizens assembly are representatives. It's just a different form of representation that doesn't pass via elections. And so when we think about these in this way, I think it also opens up a whole new way of thinking about what potential role these new institutions could be playing in our democracy. And on the point of, of binding, I mean, I, I, I take the, no, I mean, I understand that there's like the legal constraints, but I think here we're also having a discussion about, you know, what is ultimately desirable and what is the end goal we might want to get to. Um, and so to me, I don't see why we would take that option off of the table. Um, it might not be feasible right now under the current treaty conditions, sure, but the question of do we want to consider it and should we, I think personally, yes, we should be considering it and also perhaps thinking about the political strategy of what we would need to be doing to, to eventually get there. So I'll leave my, my remarks there. Thank you. So unpacking the question of representation is, is key in this, in this story, but there is a, what Jamie talked about. Um, I find that when we discuss these issues, you know, with a broader public, um, there is also the sense that who are these citizens? They were chosen by an algorithm or randomly, and random has a very negative connotation in, in our everyday language. So this question of who do they represent, which is kind of an amplified question to also civil society, is part of this conversation, and it's part of the the, the way in which we frame this issue. So Claudia, I'm with you that it is another form of representation, um, but that's, we need to still find the story for that. So I, if Eve, you want to jump in on this last point, um, yeah. haven't seen any of the other, uh, and perhaps Nicolo after you. Um, yes, I, I totally agree with Claudia. Um, I think that whatever we think, what the, the ultimate goal uh, should be, we have to differentiate what we would like and what is possible now. We can be pragmatic and reformist for the time being, uh, but there is some kind of, uh, as uh, John Elster said, of ci civilizing force of uh, the uh, hypocrisy, uh, namely that a bad experiment, because the conference on the future of, of Europe is really badly organized, could lead to something, for example, the institutionalization of a permanent citizen assembly, which won't be very powerful. But this could lead also uh, in a second step to something much more substantial. And uh, effectively, when we think about citizen assemblies as a new form of representation, we could then think the citizen assembly to some extent, like the upper chamber in many countries, uh, perhaps not the final word, but not only consultative. Something in between the in betweenness, um, Nicolo. Thanks. Uh, maybe just um, riffing on that. I think that the 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 teleology and the narrative of the institution is for me, one of the most important things, that it is um, too easy to, to argue that the European Union has been created by elites uh, behind the backs of the citizens. An institution which is very explicitly made in full transparency with the greatest participation of the citizens that can be mustered uh, would really be a kind of antidote to that. And so I think it's not just about what it is we want to uh, achieve, it's also about how it is we get there and being conscious of being as inclusive as we can in the way we do it. And, and that's why it's excellent that it's brought up so often in the chat about and in the discussion about our inclusiveness and those people that we're 
excluding. Uh, and so we need to be opportunistic, but also hold open the space. And that means in space of uncertainty about what's gonna happen precisely to allow other voices to come in and other leaders of the conversation to come in um, as we work towards building a permanent European Citizens Assembly. Nicolo, I think it's very appropriate that you had the last word on inclusiveness, because I think this very first experiment inside the experiment inside the experiment, that is our first public democracy forum, uh, was, I hope, a, a successful experiment. I wish we could have heard many of, of you still on the call, um, but it, we are beyond time. So I, I think in the name of my co-conveners, um, Nicolo and Alberto, I, I, and, and as well as the team, um, I'd like to say that we hopefully will come back to this topic in a few months time with much more knowledge of what has happened in the Conference on the Future of Europe, obviously, of the French presidency and its ambitions on the front of deliberative democracy. And indeed, in the bigger picture of European politics in the world and, and the extent to which um, this whole story that we're talking about today can also be part of the narrative as we discuss the value added of democracy and autocracy and probably everything in between as Biden organizes his summit on democracy next weekend, as we hold our own panel in Florence also next weekend. So much is happening, so much to think about. So ce n'est qu'un au revoir. I hope you will all join us again next time. Uh, and indeed there is a next time very close to now, a public version of our more co conventional uh, UI democracy forum on Thursday, four to six, to which you're also invited, and that will be a hybrid event. So thank you everybody for joining us today. And um, we wish you the best in your democratic life in Europe and beyond. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, bye. Bye. Hey, Gabriella, wonderful to bye. have you. Bye. Bye. Where's Karsten? There is a four host meeting now at uh, seven o'clock. Well, yes, but isn't it is it on this link or with a separate li link? I think it was a, a separate link. Okay, it's a separate link. Yes, it is a separate link. I wasn't 